apology. <laughs> uh, well, it's a pleasure to be to be here, and uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to give a brief history of Judaism, and then I want to talk about the four contemporary movements, Reform, Reconstructionist, Conservative, and Orthodox Judaism. And then I want to open, then I want to open up for Q&A if, if people want to uh, have a discussion. Um, and if I, you know, if I'm going too slowly and what I'm saying is obvious, kind of give me a bored look or something like that. And, um, if, and if I'm going too fast, just kind of give me a, you know, a curious look and, you know, and I'll, and I'll try to explain or kind of say like this. All right, so Judaism goes back about 4,000 years. Now, it's true that when we date the history of the world traditionally, it's 5,700 plus years. But the reality is that Jewish history can be traced back about 4,000 years. Um, the stories that we find in the Hebrew Bible, and when, when I use the term Hebrew Bible, that's the same as when Christians use the term Old Testament. But for us, we don't have a New Testament. So for us, the only testament, so to speak, is the Hebrew Bible. So and we also call it the Tanakh, or the Hebrew Scriptures. So the, the Bible um, is a combination, from our point of view, from a liberal Jewish point of view, and now I'm talking about the three major groups, Reform, Reconstructionist, and Conservative Judaism, those three groups make up about 90% of contemporary American Jews. So even though the Orthodox are more visible, right, if, if a gentleman was walking down the street and had a kippah, had a yarmulke on, um, and was walking on a Saturday morning to synagogue rather than riding, you'd have a, you, know, you could assume that person is probably an Orthodox Jew. Right? So Orthodox Jews are more visible, or if they're Hasidic Jews, if they wear long black coats. Everybody's seen Hasidic Jews, right? Long beards. Um, you, you know, then you could, then you could assume they were Hasidic Jews, and that's a subset of Orthodox Jews. But 90% of American Jews are not Orthodox. In fact, in the state of Israel, about 20% of the population, of the Jewish population of Israel, is Orthodox. Uh, but the vast majority are non-Orthodox. So when I talk about Judaism from a liberal point of view, this pretty much reflects the majority of Jews in America and the world in the way in which they look at Judaism. So from a liberal Jewish point of view, the Bible is a combination of history, legend, and myth. We take it seriously, but not literally. In other words, we feel that this Bible is our inheritance and a gift that the Jewish people have given to Christianity and Islam and to Western culture. And I don't mean that in any kind of you know, arrogant way. I mean that that's what the history of religion. That is that Judaism influenced Christianity and Judaism and Christianity influenced Islam and Islam influenced an incredibly large part of the world. Um, that's just the evolution of religious thought and religious ideas. But this Bible to us is not a document where we say, how do I know the Bible tells me so? You know, when Christian fundamentalists or Orthodox Jews, when they look at the Bible, they say, this is God's word. And who am I not to listen, they, they would say, who am I not to listen to God's word and to obey it, literally, as much as possible? But from a liberal Jewish point of view, these are stories with a kernel of history and built on that kernel kind of concentric circles of um, interpretation, mythology, all rolled together. The liberal Jew doesn't ask, um, you know, what's true, what's science, and what's history? Um, it's a very difficult question to answer. What we say is, what can we glean morally from these stories. So sometimes we look at Moses' leadership role, just to use him as one example, and we say there's a lot to emulate because as Moses is described in the Torah, by the way, the Torah is the first part of the Hebrew Bible. There are three sections, Torah, prophets, and writings. Right? Those are the three sections. 
So the Torah, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books, what we have in the scroll, if, uh, how many people have seen a Torah scroll up close, right? So you know a Torah scroll, you'll see it in an in ark, in a closet, in an ark in the center of the pulpit of a synagogue. And in, and in that Torah are the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So when we look at a figure like Moses, we say this gentleman had incredible leadership skills. You know, today, like, you go into Barnes & Noble, and every book, it seems, is about, you know, leadership, right? But he had incredible leadership skills. He was incredibly patient when the Jewish people worshipped the golden calf or when they wanted to turn back and said life was better in slavery than walking around in the wilderness. He was able, when you read those stories, to mediate between God and the people. Sometimes he said to the people, you got to shape up. Sometimes he said to God, have empathy on this people. After all, they were slave people doing the best they can. So, um, so you know, you see tremendous leadership ability. And you say, look, what can we learn from Moses? We can emulate that kind of patience and that dedication to his task. And even the inevitable poignant end of the story in the book of Deuteronomy, where he doesn't get to cross over into Eretz Yisrael, into Israel, to Palestine. He doesn't get to cross over because that's the story of everyone's life. You know, we dream of being able to reach certain goals, and we reach some of them, but we never reach all of them. So there's so many lessons in the life of Moses. I'm just using his, him as an example. But then we see stories, let's say, of Jacob and Esau wrestling even in their mother's womb, and then Jacob turns out his name, Yaakov, means heel, right? He's a heel in the same sense we use it in modern English today. He's a kind of manipulative and, and self-centered and a mama's boy and uh, um, uh, deceitful. And we see in Jacob, he manipulates his brother Esau, and he manipulates his father Isaac, um, and I don't know how familiar everybody is with these stories, but I'm assume some familiarity either from the Bible or the Quran or just from general learning. But Jacob, at the end of his life, or I should say the middle of his life, he's about to reunite with Esau after several decades, and he's at the Yabok River. And the night before he crosses over to reunite with the brother from whom he's estranged, he wrestles, according to the story, he wrestles with an angel or a messenger or, if you're a Jungian, with his shadow side, and he emerges with a limp, and he limps away from that encounter. And yet his name is changed from Yaakov, the heel, the supplanter, the deceiver, to Yisrael, the one who wrestles with God and prevails. That's what the name Yisrael, Israel, means, the one who wrestles with God and prevails. So he goes from being a completely self-centered and manipulative to being somebody who can kind of face himself. You know the phrase, no pain, no gain? That, st that phrase is very post-biblical, but it very much describes that story of Jacob and Esau. He limps away, he's hurt, he's different, but he's gained insight. He is what we call in Jewish tradition a mensch. He's a humane, caring being. Um, so that's the way our approach to the Bible. We can learn from the stories of people who were sublimely um, powerful, insightful, good leaders like Moses, and from people who were really very difficult to take like Jacob, but in seeing the kind of curve of his life, the arc of his life, we can see how he emerged. So for us, the Bible isn't a story where we have to idealize everyone and say, oh, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob, Rachel, and Leah, these are perfect human beings, Moses, whoever. No, they were human beings. You know, one of the characteristics of Judaism is that for us, the belief in a Messiah is not that the Messiah is the son of God, half supernatural, half natural, born of a virgin. That's not a Jewish belief. It's a Christian belief. Um, for us, in Jewish tradition, the belief in the Messiah is Messiah is a person, exactly like everybody in this room, right? a person. 
And that person takes a leadership role in creating a life of justice and peace and so transforms the world. He's kind of like a biblical prophet, but on steroids, you know? He's a really powerful, um, self-actualized, driven by passionate social justice kind of human being. Um, so Jews very much are of this world. And when I say that, I don't say that as a criticism of any other religion. It's very hard to talk about your political group or your religious group without some comparison. I mean, how do you talk about being a Democrat except in comparison to some degree with Republicans or a Jew in comparison to Christianity or Islam? So, and you know, there are many ways in which Judaism is much closer to Islam than it is to Christianity. American, Americans don't know that because, you know, Jews and Christians have lived here longer in larger numbers, although Jews are a very small number. You know, we're about 6 million Jews, 5.7 million Jews in America. But we've lived here since, you know, mid-17th century. So, um, um, and we've built our bonds to the Christian society. And so sometimes Judaism is defined using Christian theological terms. But the reality is, as far as I understand about Islam, Jesus is a prophet in Islam, but Jesus is a person, right? In Judaism, Jesus is not a key figure. He was a rabbi, he was a teacher, he did good things. Um, but uh, he's not, you know, he's, he's not as precious to us as the biblical prophets or other rabbis who came along. And those rabbis are reflected in the second text I want to mention, and that's the Talmud. Now, the Talmud, you know, the Bible, you know, I could sort of hold in my hand like this. All right? I mean, the Bible, you've seen, the Bible in Hebrew is about this big, and the Bible in Hebrew and English is maybe twice as big. The Talmud is 63 folio volumes. Folio volume is like an encyclopedia. Like, think of it, you know, way three times the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? 63 folio volumes, that's the Talmud. And it has a little text in the center of the page, and then it has commentary all around it, and then it has commentary around that, and then it has commentary in the back of the book. And that text spans from about 500 BCE, that's what, how we date time, BCE, not BC before Christ, because Christ is not an important demarcation point for Jews, so we say before the common era, the era shared by other world religions, and CE in the common era rather than AD, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, we wouldn't say that because Jesus wasn't our Lord. So from about 500 BCE to 500 CE, about a thousand years, the Talmud is written and interpreted and interpreted again and interpreted again. Sometimes Jews are called people of the book. Right? You know who called Jews people of the book? Yeah. Hmm? Muslims did, right? So some of the Jews are called people of the book. But we're really people of the commentary on the book. Because we never thought that the Bible, you know, the way the New Testament is for Christianity, or to some degree the Quran, again, this is the limit of my understanding, is to Islam, although there's a lot of commentary on the Quran, right? Through different uh, forms of interpretive schools. But even more, so much more than Christianity and a little bit more than Islam, where it, it's the commentary on the book. When we study Jewish tradition, we don't flip the pages of the Bible as much as we flip the pages of later books commenting on the Bible. Because we believe in every sense in evolution, not just in science, but we believe in the evolution of learning and growth and moral development. Um, and so we think that the, a text that comes later, not every text that comes later, but that texts that come later can shed light on texts that came earlier. So we're more bound to the latest interpretation than over the original text. Now in the Talmud, in that 500 BC to 500 CE, when that span of roughly 1,000 years, when the Talmud no longer answered modern questions, and when I say modern, I mean 500 CE, because every era thinks it's modern, right? We think we're modern. In 100 years, we're going to look pretty old, right? 
So, um, so when 500 CE, when they had to interpret it, they kept writing what are called shelot uchuvot, questions and answers, or questions, Talmudic questions and responsa. And this process continues to this day. And then codes were written. Because if you have a 63 volume text, very few people can master that text, right? Very few people can even find anything in that book when they want to look something up. So they, these medieval codes were distilled into one volume or four volumes. And they, the, what the most famous is called the Shulchan Aruch, which means the set table. And it's called the set table because it has a table of contents. The table of contents idea enters Judaism in the Middle Ages. So somebody who isn't a great scholar, but wants to know laws of agriculture, laws of marriage, laws of raising, raising kids, whatever it might be of ethical behavior in business, can now look in a table of contents to find the rules rather than going through 63 volumes. And again, that process continues to this day. Now, having said all that about the chain of Jewish law, started with the Torah and the Bible, the Tanakh, and continued through the Talmud, and then the medieval codes, and the continuation of the questions and answers. Having said all of that, the majority of people today who rely on that legal tradition to guide their lives is a relatively small sliver of the Jewish community. Again, do you remember what percent I said of American Jews are Orthodox? Anybody remember? 10, okay? So of that 10%, maybe 10% of that 10%, you know, like it's 8%, 1%, 10% of that 10% run their lives by Jewish law. Now, why then people, you know, and if you've known Jews, you know the Jews are generally very proud to be Jewish, right? Um, their pride is not so much based on the fact they think their texts are better. Jews don't think their religion is better. I'm not saying there aren't arrogant Jews. Trust me, I know a lot of Jews that are arrogant Jews. But it's, Judaism doesn't believe it's the only way. You know, there are some religious traditions, in fact, I think many religious traditions in the world, that believe theirs is the one way, the only way, the best way. Um, Judaism um, is, uh, in that way, universalistic. Even in Talmudic times, a couple thousand years ago, the, one of the famous quotes in the Talmud is, the righteous of all nations have a share in the world to come. Meaning that you can worship Allah, Jesus, Adonai, that's our name for God, you can worship trees. You can worship nothing. If you're a good person, that's what righteous means in there, right, you know, the righteous of all nations. If you're a good moral person, if there's a heaven, you're going there. And there are other things in the Talmud that basically say, don't act like there's a heaven. Talmudic Jews believed that there would be a place after death called heaven. But they said, don't be like a servant who serves his master, meaning God. Don't be like a servant who serves his master for reward. Do a good deed for its own sake. The reward of a good deed is a good deed. So we're very this worldly. We're very here and now. Um, if there's a heaven, that's great. If there's not a heaven, this is the arena that counts. Um, but the most important thing I want to leave you with is that, that we don't think we're the only true religion or the best religion. I think most Jews feel Judaism is the best religion for them, but they recognize because they were born into it or they became a Jew by choice, which is the, word, the phrase we use today for convert. In fact, let's even talk about the word convert. You know, remember I said much of the terminology in America is based on Christian terminology of religion because that's how Americans think about religion. Well, we don't even have a word for conversion to Judaism. We have the word in Hebrew, giur, means naturalization. So it's a little bit like if you're born in Turkey and you want to become an American citizen, you go through a process of naturalization. You learn English, you learn about the Constitution, you know, you, 
uh, and then you take a test and you pledge allegiance to the United States. So you know, that's what Judaism, that's what quote unquote conversion to Judaism is. It's naturalization to the Jewish people. So you can be an agnostic, you can be an atheist, you can be a believer, you can keep the dietary laws, the laws of kashrut, you know, like your halal. You can keep that, or you, keep, you don't have to keep it. If you pledge allegiance, so to speak, you become part, I don't mean literally pledge allegiance, but you become part of the Jewish people, you become naturalized into the Jewish people, you're Jewish. This is very different than Christianity and Islam as I understand it. In Christianity, you can be born of two, Jew, two Christian parents, but if you don't believe Jesus is the Christ, you're not really a Christian, right? And if you're born of one or two Muslim parents, but you don't believe, and you know, if, if I'm wrong, please let me know that during the Q&A. If you're born of two Muslim parents, but you don't believe um, that uh, God is Allah and Muhammad is his prophet, then you're not really a Muslim. You know, I don't mean anybody kind of writes you out and says you can't come to the mosque, but the, from the point of view of Islam, you're not really a Muslim if you don't have the belief system. Judaism is different in this regard. Again, it doesn't make it better or worse, but it's different. And sometimes it's very frustrating for Jews to have people assume they understand Judaism because they understand their own tradition. Traditions like languages and culture are different. You can't use the typology of one religion to explain all religions. Imagine trying to use Christianity to understand Zen Buddhism. I mean, that really is apples and oranges, right? So, um, so every religion, every culture has its own integrity. You can only understand it kind of like being an anthropologist, you know, immersing yourself in it, be a participant observer, watch it closely understand the way it uses terms. Um, so um, what characterizes a, a Jew today? Um, Jews feel very bound to each other. They feel very much like a family. Uh, often we refer to ourselves as an uh, evolving religious cultural civilization or a, a peoplehood. We use words like that a lot because we recognize the diversity of belief does not undermine someone's Jewish identity. We feel very bound to each other. So if, you know, if I go to a synagogue, if I'm traveling and I go to a synagogue in Paris or London or Istanbul or, you know, Wyoming, although I've been to all those other places, I've never been to Wyoming, but if, if, if I go to those places, I will go to a synagogue I want to seek out Jews, not just see the synagogue physically, but I want to be there for prayer. I want to, I want to meet uh, my fellow Jews, and invariably I will get a meal. You know, it's a little bit like coming here. You come here, you always get fed well, right? Or when Pacifica Institute came to University Synagogue a few times, they brought us the greatest food, and we appreciated it. And then and the shura pudding, you know, I mean, just great stuff. So, but the reality is that you know you know that you will bond with your fellow Jews around the world wherever you go. Um, Judaism is the soul, or I'd say Jewish religion, let's say, is the soul of Judaism, but Judaism is a term more akin to Hellenism. If I use the term Hellenism, you know what Hellenism means, Greek culture, Greek civilization, Greek language, Greek food, Greek music, right? It doesn't refer to Greek religion, Greek religion is a subset. In the same way, Jewish religion is a subset of Judaism, but culture, shared interests, shared past, a sense of belonging, a shared future, that's what binds people. And there's also, in our own day, Israel and Zionism. Um, Jews, as you know, um, were landless from the year 70 CE to 1948. And um, it was a painful exile because we were at the mercy of majority societies that didn't treat us well. Uh, in fact, Muslim societies treated us better than Christian societies, but even in Muslim societies, we were second-class citizens. Um, um, uh, there was a golden age in Spain, as I think everybody knows, Convivencia, and that was a big exception to the rule in Jews, Christians, and Muslims 
had this glimmer of you know a couple centuries, a little less than a couple centuries, where the ideal society in a way was um, was created under Muslim influence. That was amazing, um, but uh, but that didn't last long enough. Um, uh, it's it's interesting when a rabbi, when a Jew stands up before a Muslim audience and talks about not just peoplehood, but Israel and Zionism. Um, the Jewish community, about 77% in most surveys, I'm talking about the American Jewish community, but also the Israeli Jewish community, not quite as high, but still in the low 70s. That means between 70 and 77% of Jews in Israel and America support a two-state solution, right? Palestinian state, Israeli state. Now, how is it possible that three quarters of Jews, both in Israel and America, support that idea, and that the official leadership of the American Jewish community and the Likud party in Israel don't get it, can't move in that direction. And the reason is fear. It's a very human emotion. We saw after 9-11, I mean, America, it was a terrible tragedy. No one wants to lessen the power of 9-11. But after 9-11, uh, Americans became uh, paranoid. They became less welcoming. They became more anti-Muslim. Um, they wouldn't eat French fries because, right? Do you remember that? They called them freedom fries. They wouldn't use the word French, you know? I mean, you know, we became crazy. We became crazy. We betrayed, as Americans, our highest ideals. Uh, you, um, that, that's out of fear. It doesn't mean Americans are bad people. In fact, in many ways, they're good people, but they, they f get afraid very easily, and they're xenophobic. You know, they're, they don't like people that are other, even though we're a society that has embraced people who are other. This is one of the crazy dichotomies of America. We're the, one of the most welcoming societies in the world to people um, uh, from around the world, and yet, a few incidents can kind of tip us over and, and belie the things we claim to stand for. Um, um, but the reality is, I think fear is what paralyzes the Middle East, that you know, sometimes the Israelis have been generous, sometimes the Palestinians have been moving more towards peace, but they somehow can't, this dance, this very crippled dance, they can't get their act together. And one side is ready, the other isn't, and then neither are ready because they're both angry at the other, and then you get some intervention by an American president sometimes, like Jimmy Carter, whoever, and you kind of feel like you're moving in that direction, and then you know, a few months or years later it falls apart. Um, I don't think that the Middle East peace problems, which I think are very serious problems, should cloud the relationship between Jews and Muslims in America. And I think, you know, one of the mistakes we sometimes make as Jews and Muslims, we can't, you know, we just are so focused on that political issue. I'm not claiming Pacific is like that at all because you've been very generous in your outreach to us. But the, that, you know, one of the problems we have in America in interfaith dialogue is that issues set us off like powder kegs, the flotilla, the Turkish flotilla that tried to enter Gaza, you know, it's a terrible tragedy. But if, if we panic and we get afraid at every tragedy, we're never going to be able to kind of build those bonds to sustain us over time that look past the politics of the moment. I, I, because I have faith in the, in the goodness of people eventually, um, I do believe that Israel and the Palestinians will be able to sit down one day and that there will be two states and people will look back and they'll say, why did it take so long? And they'll realize that every death that happened after 1967 was probably a wasted death on all sides because the deal that there was in the Alon plan, Yigal Alon was a very liberal member of the Knesset of the parliament where he suggested basically giving back the land and, and getting a peace treaty and, you know, the alone plan in one form or the other is every plan that's come since then. So eventually, roughly along those lines, there will be two states, you know, the Israeli state will be more or less within the pre-67 borders, there will be some land swaps, everything we talk about now, eventually 
is going to happen, and there'd be terrible loss of life because people couldn't get there before. But I put the blame on both sides, um, and and not just both sides, but all the sides, you know, because there are a lot of players uh, in the Middle East, including Russia and China and all the Arab states and everybody else. So, um, but it shouldn't get in the way of Jews and Muslims or Jews, Christians and Muslims being able to talk to each other about, especially in this society in America, about what really we share in common. And when we don't share it in common, that should make us curious about the other and to kind of want to know. So what is your tradition or what do you feel about this? And sometimes we're going to find that contemporary Jews and Muslims are reflections of their traditions. And sometimes we're going to find that our stereotypes of what we thought we knew about the other, because we have learned something about the other tradition, doesn't really describe the contemporary Jew or Muslim at all.